Hi, my name is Allison Arnold. I'm the extension agent here in Bookham County, and I'll be your host today. We do not have a handout today, so welcome to Gardening in the Mountains, Gardening Seasonal Transitions. I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Laura Carter. Laura is the manager of Time in the Garden, a family-owned garden center located in Woodfin, just north of Asheville. They specialize in containers, plants, and accessories for small spaces. Laura is a graduate of Warren Wilson College and has 25 years experience with plants and community gardens. She also finds time to create drawings and paintings focused on plants and plant growth cycles. We're excited to have her with us today to share her creative artistic skills and plant knowledge to help us know how to design and seasonally transition containers for year-round interest. Today's presentation has been pre-recorded, and Laura is here with us in person to answer your container gardening questions throughout the video. I want to give thanks to John Bowen, an Extension Master Gardener volunteer here in Buncombe County, who worked with Laura to put together this video presentation, make it possible, and is also helping us today with our technical navigation of making this presentation come alive. And now let's hear from Laura. Thanks for having me out to y'all's group today. We're here at Time in the Garden, our family-run business here in Woodfin, North Carolina, just north of Asheville. It's September, we're beginning the month and the cooler nights are starting. It's been really hot the last couple of weeks, but now cooler season is on its way and we're ready to start looking into fall and winter pots. We're just about to head over and look at a pot that was planted in early summer, late spring, and it got really big and some of the things have really overgrown and we've started to rip out some of them. Before we clean out completely, I wanna show you how we're gonna transition it into the next couple of months for fall and into winter. We're going to be talking about a few things, including this container here. It was planted in late spring, early summer, mainly with annual plants. And now that some of the things are starting to fade, we have some options. And we're going to be talking about a way to transition this pot through the fall and into the winter. A couple stages there. I'd like to give you some inspiration about how to transition some of your summer pots at this point of time. And then later on, we'll talk about just some good practices for container gardening into the cold season, making sure your pots are protected and set up to do well year round. And then after that, we'll cover some of my favorite perennials that we use year round, whether it is spring or fall, perennials that do really well and continue to look well, not just in their particular one season, but year round. So I will look forward to going over this with you. Here we have this large penicetum. That's an annual penicetum. This is really its time of year to be really showy. The other annuals that we've already removed were really starting to finish off. We're going to leave the penicetum, this coleus here, for at least another couple months until we start getting freezes or so they really start deteriorating. So we have some options, and you could just focus on more seasonal fall plants. Chrysanthemums come to mind. People really enjoy using other things that are not evergreen that go along with a theme like ornamental peppers and celosia. You know, those are some seasonal plants you could choose to put in and would look fantastic. And I have some of those as an example, but I'm going to try to focus on plants that have that seasonality that's going to transition into the cool season. And we're just on the cusp of starting to bring some of those into the garden center here. So one of my choices would be this chrysanthemum. Now it is still going to be considered a seasonal plant. You could rip it out and put it in the garden after it has bloomed and see if it overwinters and then be considered a perennial. However, a lot of people don't do that. They just treat it as an annual and enjoy its bold color and shape for right now. I think the coloring looks really beautiful with these dark colors here. It's going to be a dark red. It's just beginning to bloom. If this was a smaller container, I might choose to go with a smaller mom. But since this is a really large container, 
I'm going to go with this eight inch pot here. So this is my one choice here that's really going to be still need to be removed and replaced come probably late October, something like that. This is a wonderful addition to containers. This is Mexican feather grass. It's not always hardy in our zone here, but it adds a great texture. And even when it turns into kind of a beigey color and it has added some bloom, it's such a great texture. And I still like that color, especially for the fall and winter months. So an option here would be to put this towards the back and enjoy its wispiness falling over the edge of the pot. Alternatively, these are other types of Carex, and we'll later on explain some of my other favorite ones, but these also very fine textured and a little more perennial. Oops. This one is called Amazon Mist Carex, and this one is Red Rooster. Red Rooster is gonna get more tall fronds and would give you some more height later on. To add some trailing winter interest, this is a type of vinca called, called Illumination. And it will last for years in a container and it will get fuller over time. I've tested several types of vinca and this is one of my favorites because it does give you more contrast and is pretty tough. It can take a variety of conditions. So I might even go and grab another one because want a little more fullness here. And then to counter that color here, to bring it back in, I really love this Ascot's rainbow. It's a little more winter hardy than some of the other garden spurges. And what did I say? It's a euphorbia called Ascot's rainbow. And I'm gonna stick it here in the back because it is going to provide a lot of nice height, especially come late winter. It's going to elongate and to really breezy, very textured blooms that are about the same color as this kind of yellowy and just lovely. People are always asking when they see it in the spring, what is that? So we have a few other varieties, but that one definitely is a favorite. I just pruned back this coleus. It had really expanded. So that's something to keep in mind this time of year. If maybe you are gonna be keeping some of your annuals still for a little bit longer because coleus will keep growing as long as it's warm. Make sure they're pruned back. Don't go crazy with fertilizer, but a little light feed could help, especially with blooming annuals. I had agora in here where the euphorbia is going. That was really pretty all summer paired with the red dahlia that was in here. Those are really past their best season. So we were just wanting to find some things that we knew were gonna be actually nice foundation come the cold season. And then when the cold does come, the coleus and this penicetum will die. And you don't necessarily have to replace them with another plant. You could simply cut back this penicetum with pruners, and then you could replace it with some red twig dogwood and or curly willow, or this, this is really a year old. So I'm just using it as an example. Of course, when you cut it in November, it will be bright, shiny red and gorgeous for most of the winter. And all you would simply do is cut your penicetum out and then arrange your sticks to give you some vertical color and dimension. And then I would be probably deciding to remove the root ball of this coleus and eventually the red mum and replacing it with probably pansies or violas or some of the other seasonal color plants that we will be talking about here shortly. They're going to be able to overwinter and give you some nice seasonal color. And then potentially next spring, you could still have some of these plantings to replace the seasonal plants with more summer annuals next year. Okay, Allison, is there any question? I had one about the pot, but I think you're going to be talking about pots in a little bit. Is that correct? Yeah, I realized that the video looks like I'm just popping in those plants and really that was meant to be just talking about selection. We will go into actual plantings. I hope that wasn't perceived as, oh, I'm just like potting these by simply dropping them. 
that's not the intention. So we're going to definitely cover that. There is a question, and I think you're going to cover this too. What kind of pot can you use outside that won't break in the winter weather? Yes, we are going to talk about that. Question. Okay, great. Can you say again what type of euphorbia that was? That variety is called Ascon Rainbow. It's the favorite of mine. It's proven to be hardier and more vigorous, but not too vigorous for consumers. Okay. There's a question about addressing plants for shade. Will you be talking about that a little bit later? Sure. Picking out particular plants for shade gardens or shady spots. They have a pot on a porch that they would like to refresh. Do you fertilize in the winter as you do in the summer? After a video, we're talking the next section about maintenance things, and okay. I definitely work on that. So. Two more questions. Would hellebores work for winter instead of pansies? My experience with hellebores in pots is that they're fine during their peak bloom season. You get them already budding and going along. So they don't love being in a pot long term. I don't think they're as drought tolerant. I do see designers using them during the winter months, but my fact that they are putting them in there temporarily. I feel like to find those perennials that you can put in and leave for at least a year or more and rely on them. Hellebores really have their particular season when they're bloom and there's nothing wrong with using them in a pot to show off that season. But when it comes to having them thrive and do well year round, it's really not the best environment for them. They prefer to be in the ground. It's up to you if you're willing to change out that pot in order to use them. Whereas pansies and violas, they are very good at filling in pots and providing color for such a long period of time. One of the main differences is that pansies and violas are going to need a little more sun to keep the bloom going than your hellebore. I would tend to use the hellebore as more of a seasonal bloom, even though it's perennial, and you can move it back out and put it in your landscape. Can you also remind us what type of vinca that you used? That variety is called Illumination, and it's very showy compared to some of the others, and it does well in a pot. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Right. So here we are. We are going to be just doing a little segment here about making sure you're doing everything you can do to winterize your containers for the cold weather. It's a good time, even though we've still got a couple months here in Western North Carolina before we start getting freezing temperatures to go ahead and think about that. One of the biggest things you can do to prevent freezing and cracking of containers is to provide good drainage to your container. You can do that in multiple ways. Another tip is to always try to find out if your container is winter hardy. It will most likely be made of a high fire stoneware and with drainage holes. So that's very important. Going back to making sure your pots are set up for good drainage, especially during the winter months, you can use, and I highly recommend, either pot feet or bricks or pieces of wood even, but just make sure that your containers are not sitting flat on any surface, whether it is the soil, garden, or a paved or brick surface or something like that. You want to make sure there's a space between the drainage hole and the surface that it's sitting on. So you can use pottery pads like these or different styles of pot feet, brick or such. We'll show you on one of our other containers what we've used. Another thing you can do to prevent cracking in pots you may not be quite sure are using inserts. We found a plastic container that's gonna fit really well in one of our ceramic pots. And there may be space underneath the pot. It may not go all the way to the ground. So you're going to want to raise it up using a brick or some kind of container so that it sits at the appropriate level and looks attractive. For example, this insert here, just a reuse of a plastic pot that we have washed out and cleaned, it happens to fit very well and it's resting on the rim without it looking particularly obstructive or anything like that. Sometimes when you are looking for a plastic insert, it may fall inside and not be the exact same size. So just use the support to raise it to the appropriate level and really just get creative with that. And while I'm here, I'm gonna go ahead and show the pottery feet that we have this sitting on. These are ceramic. 
There's different styles, but very useful for raising a pot up off the surface of the ground, three or four, to do the right job and get them centered and steady. And that way the drainage is working well, your pottery is gonna be well protected. Now don't feel like you have to use an insert like this. It's just a flexible tool, especially for larger containers. This pot here really is still a good reasonable size to plant directly into it, but just for ease of demonstration and here in our garden center, I do like to have pre-made inserts that you can pick up and take home. And then it leaves my pots free for purchase. It's versatile here for the garden center, but it's also a great tool for you guys. If you find a good insert that fits your pots, hold on to it year to year and reuse them. So in addition to good drainage techniques, using a good potting mix is really important. This is a very friable, high content of perlite in it. It is going to help with good drainage and keeping your plants providing enough moisture, but not too much. So I recommend using a good quality potting mix. We did start carrying a locally made potting mix, Dirt Craft, made out in Marshall. Really good quality. It is peat free and all organic ingredients. And people that are especially container gardening for tropical houseplants are really loving that mix. I use Osmocote mostly for container gardening. This soil, this is a mix from the ProMix series that does not have fertilizer in it. So to keep things, especially like pansies and violas and annuals blooming really well, I use Osmocote. It is a good slow release and you use apply it to the top of the soil when you're finished planting. Then another indisposable tool for me is this weeder. You can also use a hoary hoary knife, but when it comes to like the other pot we were looking at earlier where I need to get in and divide out either a perennial that's overgrown or I want to remove the entire thing, but keep its root ball, a nice deep tool like this that has a serrated edge, you can chop in around the root ball and get in there and it really does the trick. I've, I haven't found any other tool. Either one of these would work. I just like the ergonomic nature of this one. It's made for a weeder to get deep tap roots, but for me for potting, it's indispensable, especially with using perennials. So I really highly recommend if you're doing a lot of potting to get one of those. Okay, I think we've covered some of the practicalities. So we're gonna transition into talking about some of our favorite perennials. I would love to share some of our plants that we have in stock right now, which is a mixture of some of our favorite perennials for container gardening and some of the seasonal plants that are gonna be, for the most part, tolerant of the cold weather later on in the season. Some of these are gonna be perennials for this season right now and even annuals, but we've also got a mixture of some of my favorites. So. For example, this Carex Everillo is such a powerhouse. This is, again, Carex Everillo. It's evergreen, and it keeps its color, and it looks pretty good throughout the winter. So I love using it on the side of a pot where it will trail over. It's just a great color and accent. Use it primarily in more shaded containers, but you can use it in the sun, especially in the winter. There's a couple other carrots here that are really nice. And hookeras, of course, perform very well in containers. We've got some euphorbias again. These are some evergreen sedums that do really well. Polonia is a very common sedum, but it is evergreen and it usually is pretty vigorous and dense. Some of the other sedums can tend to get a little leggy and not as attractive. When I've really got a tough pot that needs a nice bright chartreuse that's gonna trail. It's really hard to beat and it can take lots of sun. It gets a little blush in the winter. And yeah, just a powerhouse of a good trailer that's evergreen. And same with some of these ajugas. This is a favorite ajuga here called Burgundy Glow. And it trails over the edge of a pot really beautifully over the course of a year or so. And has three different colors, pairs really well with lots of other plants. We've talked about some of the euphorbias. This one is called Silver Swan, and this one's called Ruby Glow. So you can see they do come in other colors. Again, will elongate and bloom in late winter, give you some height. 
And it is hard to beat corabels for containers because they are very drought resistant. So when you're picking perennials and you want them to last long in your pots, you want to be looking for plants that are pretty drought tolerant because pots tend to be on the drier side, especially the smaller pots tend to be drying out very quickly. So you always know that you're choosing a good perennial is going to have a better chance of long-term survival in a pot when it does have that tolerance of drier conditions. An example of a seasonal planting that I've seen a lot in the winter would be a hellebore, and they are not as drought resistant. And so while they're very pretty in the middle of the winter when they're in bloom, they can struggle a little bit to be in smaller containers. So it's going to be something that's going to be need to be changed out more quickly instead of a longer term planting in a pot. Still very beautiful. I use the corabels quite a bit for winter containers. And sometimes if it's very shaded pot, then it's hard to grow things like pansies and violas because it's just too shaded there. I sometimes just resort to maybe three different colors of corabels and it fills up a pot really beautifully. You can add in some of these shady trailers to give you some other shape, but they are a really excellent choice for container gardening year round. And then over here, we've got another favorite, the Eastern wood fern, and it is actually an evergreen fern. So I like using it and I've had them in pots for years. It does need to be a good size container because it will expand and get much taller. You know, it's gonna, lose a few fronds in the winter for sure, but you are gonna have its presence and it gives you for a shadier location, some really nice vertical shape. And you know, it's hard to find an evergreen fern sometimes in our climate. So highly recommend using that variety in a shadier location. And let's talk for a moment about some of these ornamental cabbages and kales. Of course, most people are familiar with them. We've got a couple different varieties and they are just beginning to get their color. They're gonna get a lot more colorful as the cold season comes on. This one here is Coral Queen, and this one is Coral Prince. It's gonna be white, and this one's gonna, so you can already see the pink, it's gonna get much darker fuchsia, pink, red color. They are susceptible to the caterpillar, the, will eat it up, but most of the time you can still get a great season out of it, and it is, resistant to freezes. It will usually succumb at some point in late December, January. However, this is an ornamental kale called red boar and doesn't look quite as impressive right now, but it is very hardy. I have very often put this in. It will get taller. It's more of a taller shape instead of round. So it works really well with other plantings and it's just extremely winter hardy and will turn a very dark purple. So I really enjoy using that one in particular. And then mixed in here, we've got some grasses. We've been talking about carex and the feather grass earlier. These are some perennial penicetums. Right now in this time of the year, they're fun to mix in as a little bit more of a seasonal planting. Come next spring, I probably would plant that in the garden and make space in the pot for a different perennial. I also want to mention the sedum. This is not an evergreen sedum, but this is called October Daphne sedum sibilii. It's a larger sedum. It can sometimes take over a pot a little bit, but I've often had them in a larger pot for a number of years. And one thing is just lovely texture and color. It stays looking pretty good compared to some of the other sedums in containers. And it's going to get these pink blooms and it can start trailing over and look quite impressive and I just really like the texture and color of that with other plants. You can see right next to this dwarf snapdragon that the orange and that blue color is a really complimentary combination. Couple other things, just look out and experiment when you are looking for perennials to use in pots. This lamium I've used a lot in pretty shady pots. Over time, it trails over the edge has great color next year in bloom. And, you know, maybe not as long lived as some of the other ones, but still nice to know. It's pretty drought tolerant as well. And it can really pair. And as we come through here, we're just looking for fun combinations of color, 
and texture, any contrast, which becomes a personal choice. You know, we all have our own preferences. Do we want a lot of high contrast or do we want something more subtle? Um, we're going to transition here to doing a little demo on a new planting. We are back over here at the potting table and I just stuck a couple seasonal plants into this pot um, as an example of what you might find out there at some of your garden centers where they are already potted for the fall season and looking really beautiful. But something to note, none of these plants are particularly going to last well into the cold season. The exception would be the kale or the cabbage here, but like I said, it will eventually likely be killed. And of course, these are very hot loving plants, croton, ormel pepper, celosia, and asparagus fern. So nothing wrong with it. If you love your seasonal fall plants like this, go for it. But I want to give you an idea of how you could enjoy this planting for probably another couple months. And then potentially, if you can still find the material out in the garden centers, could tr transition it back into something for winter. So we're going to be taking out these. And, you know, as you're looking for your plants, I'm sure you've all heard the different adage of looking for a thriller, spiller, filler. You know, it depends a lot of times on the location where you're going to be viewing the pot and what your intentions are. If you're going to be walking by it and you're looking down on it, I don't give as much credence to needing something really tall. It's nice to just look at the palette just like you were looking just now, but something that's maybe a little bit of a lower planting. But if you're going to be looking from afar, you may want to really focus on something that's going to give you that height as well. So we are going to be looking at some options. I do want to mention here that we do carry some dwarf conifers, um, which are really great for container gardening because they are slower growing. And their mature size is not so large that they are going to eventually really overgrow the pot. It does depend on the individual species. So keep that in mind and think about the size pot that you are potting in. If you're starting with a little bit larger one, you know, it's not going to give you as much room in the pot to add other perennials and annuals, but maybe you want the presence of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I will actually use one of those as more of an accent instead of the centerpiece. Again, it does also a lot of times depend on, is that a formal setting or do you want maybe the shape of it is maybe leaning, giving you more of a filler shape instead of a central thriller shape. So some options there when thinking about your evergreen containers, your evergreen shrubs in pots. And then thinking about also your sun and shade. I think I indicated this earlier when talking about corabels, but this goes for other plants that traditionally might need a little bit of more shade. Let's look at this beautiful electrica corabel here. It is stunning. It has got the red veins in it, it's just really popping. Traditionally, hookera that has a more chartreuse coloring is going to be more sensitive, in my experience, to sun. However, I have learned that if you're going to be planning on pulling that plant out for next summer and replacing it with annuals, you could get away with putting in a lighter color hookera in a sunnier spot because Usually the winters, the sun is different and it doesn't burn them as much. So you have a real versatility there with your shade perennials. I'm going to figure out my design here. It's really just pulling from what I've got in front of me. Maybe we'll go ahead and use this beautiful hookera because it is stunning. So I've already filled my pot with fresh potting mix. and. Depending on the root ball, you're going to potentially be loosening up a little bit. This one doesn't need that. It's got roots to the bottom, but not overly compacted. So I'm going to just lightly place it in there until I get my design made. Now, I would, would li always like to share this when I do d potting demos. You will see me twisting and turning my plants around. And it's not absolutely necessary, but I tend to think that it does come out a little more 
they tend to grow together a little bit better when you think about the existing shape. So I can see this side is how where it was growing is more of its back, and this is more of its front. So I'm facing it outward where it's going to be looked at, and I'll probably be planting something else at its back so that they just get a good start. They will move and change and fill in depending on where they are growing, but but it just gives you a good feeling when you can make something set it off from the beginning in a good way in relationship to its others. So I've settled it into one side of the pot and I'm angling it just slightly so that, you know, it's facing outward. So to go with this, we're looking at something that might be considered part sun to shade. So I might want to go ahead and grab one of these, these eastern wood ferns. This is a planting that in this size pot, it may be pushing it in terms of really keeping it long term for, for like over a year. I'm for the sake of demoing, I would potentially be working with a little bit bigger container. But here on this table, I just want to be able to show my thought process. But, you know, again, it's your comfort level. Are you filling this pot really for just the winter? Or are you thinking long-term about where and how you want to manage the pot? And think of your container plantings as works in progress and know that you can always tweak it come next spring. You can still leave some of these that are working really well for you. And, you know, you, you can always move and adjust. They keep things looking their prime, even in long-term perennial plantings, you're gonna always be doing a little bit of tweaking. So I'm gonna look at this from this angle. But if you really want to have all angles, you'd be thinking about what on this side we're gonna be putting in to give you like a counter, something really beautiful, or maybe this pot would be placed at the entryway by your front door where there really is a back to it. So we're thinking about that as we're planting. Where are we looking at this pot will help really determine your design. Okay, so we've got a dark green and a chartreuse. Maybe we could look for something that's gonna bring in this color here. If this was a pot that was getting still a few hours of sunlight, you could still be putting in your annuals that are gonna overwinter, like your snapdragons or your violas and pansies. So this is a dwarf snapdragon. You can use it in the ground as a bedding plant. You can use it in pots. They do really well as long as you continue to pinch the tops off once they're blooming. And in this time of year, you need to give all your blooming annuals a good dose of some kind of fertilizer so that they can get established and build their plant in order to overwinter and keep blooming for you. So just when this bloom is finished, just pinch it off because it makes lots of side shoots. It's really going to pull some of those darker veins really beautifully. And snapdragons in particular will benefit being in a little bit of part shade come the warmer weather next winter. You know, it's not a given that they will overwinter, but the mild winters that we have been having, they very often do. Especially you can get them in early enough to get established and keep them fertilized and pinched back. They do a lot for you perform very well. I have often, when I didn't have any other option besides snapdragons, I've popped them in for a certain amount of time in a pot, and then the plant was still very healthy, and I've pinched them back and stuck them in the ground, and they've stayed in the ground for over a year and have kept blooming and blooming for me. So they are really good, good work. They do good work for us. Okay, so a little bit of color there on that side of the pot. I enjoy mixing my violas and pansies, especially because the different sizes, little, little violas. So let me grab one over here. There's something really sweet about the way that they will pop in and fill in around other plants. So again, they do need some sun. If this is going in a really shaded location, I wouldn't be planting these. You need to make sure that you're gonna use them in a spot with, you know, several hours of filtered sun, at least, at the minimum. 
So as we work here, let's adjust and see what else we want to add. Okay, so after considering what to do with this pot, I'm going to take it a direction where maybe we don't have enough sun for the pansies and violas, which are really hard to beat for, they are quite winter hardy. I just want to put a word for them because some people think of them as old fashioned. And, but in our climate here in Western North Carolina, again, once you get them established and fertilized, you can get snow on top of them and they will sometimes even bloom while it's snowing. Just know that in the middle of winter, you will probably get some dieback. If you at all, by end of February, still have a little nub of green at the very base, cut back to that point, start giving them a feed. Once temperatures get up into the upper 40s and 50s, get them some osmocote, and they will completely flush and replace themselves and bloom till it gets hot in June. A lot of people don't realize that they can get quite severely impacted by winter and still come back quite strongly. And then other winters, they don't even get that knock back. They get a little leggy and you have to cut them back, fertilize them, and they just keep on going. So if you have enough sun for them, definitely try growing them and plant them in the fall. We will restock for a short while come March to, to fill back in on gaps, but they're much more widely available in the fall for your cool season color. And I am talking about violas and pansies here. I love them both. Deadheading is also important. So just make sure that when it's bent, you know, you can take back the whole stem, not just the blossom there. But getting back to my design here, let's imagine that we don't have, I put a little bit of Snapdragon in there just cause I want to have that a little bit of color, but maybe I'm not too sure about how much sun this pot is going to get. Maybe I just moved, you know, which is a common thing we hear here. And people are just not quite sure how much sun they're going to get, especially around entryways. Very often they're covered and don't get a lot of sun. We're just going to go ahead and stick some things in here that are very shade tolerant and evergreen. So this Carex is going to be a really pretty contrast in texture to the existing plants that are here. And this is a really great sedum. It's called Coral Reef. It's also known as Chinese sedum. Slightly different texture shape to the leaf than a lot of the other sedums. I really like this one because you can actually grow it in shade or sun. What's cool about it is that like it's showing here, it's displaying its dark green color. This is gonna look like this when it's getting more shade. When it gets lots of sun, it's actually going to turn a dark bronze color. So this would be pretty either way. If this pot ends up getting more sun, then this bronze color would be really complementary to what's in here. Otherwise, the green is also very pretty because we've got this bright chartreuse. Sometimes you might even have to divide up a sedum, and that's fine. If, as long as you can get a piece that's got some root ball here, if it's too bulky, Divide a little bit off. Again, just make sure you're getting some root ball attached to the top because that's what's going to be successful for growing. And make sure you get that root ball tucked in there well. So you've noticed I had a foundation of soil and this part is already rooting. I'm going to go ahead and stick it over here and it will eventually fall over the edge of a pot. And now I'm going to come back in with a little top dressing of some extra soil and fill in and make sure the roots are covered. When you water, sometimes things fall down and the roots are exposed. So you want to be aware of that. If you see gaps, go back in and fill in. Osmocote is just applied lightly. I mean, it, you can read the directions, but from experience, I'm just going in and top dressing here, tucking in the roots, turning as I go. You can see there's the back of the pot and it's definitely not as full, but that fern is gonna get a lot bigger. And 
again, if you were going to be looking at this side of the pot, you could come back in here maybe with a different sedum or even if the pot was bigger with a different colored corabel. We've got this gorgeous purple here. It's in a really large size pot, so I would tend to look for the four and a half inch size corabels for smaller containers. Otherwise, if you're doing large containers, a gallon size corabel would work. Then make sure you water in your plants and check back on them. Make sure you clean them up and arrange them how you like. I had requested to show a couple photos from my work in the past. This is a photograph of a planting I did at a customer's house. This was just after planting, taken the same day. I do want to point out before we go to the next photo, one of the plants I didn't have in stock when we filled this is that green plant in the middle. It's called Rumex or Bloody Dog, and it's got the red veins. And it's really great. It is actually perennial. It looks a little bit like Swiss chard, but it does like the cooler season. So I like using them in fall containers and they last pretty well through the winter and into the spring and even summer months. If we go to the next photo, you're going to see the same planting and how it overwintered. I thought, did I have and you can see that the Rumex there is not quite as focal as it was in the fall, but the Corabel has gone to blue and the Violas and the Burgundy Glow Ajuga has really filled in dramatically. And this customer does take excellent care of her pot. I did speak a little bit to some of the maintenance there in the video about how to get the best result from your pansies and violas. In terms of other maintenance, I wanted to just take a couple minutes and tell you a couple more things to make sure your pots are going to last and perform really well. Of course, winter to winter, you can't always guarantee that the plants are going to do quite this well. You can see that this pot was also stuck close up against the house and in a little bit of a protected spot. I have worked with this customer for a long time and she's meticulous in her deadheading and watering and pruning of her pots and they just keep really well for a long time. In the winter, we can have such a dramatic fluctuation of temperature. So it's important to keep in mind that your pots will occasionally need to be watered. Of course, if they're not getting any precipitation because they're stuck near an entryway, you're going to be in the habit of keeping an eye on their water needs. But sometimes people tend to forget about watering their pots in the winter. That's understandable if it's freezing. We don't need to water if it's freezing. But if we have those warm spells where we're getting temperatures up into the 60s, sometimes 50s, and it's been really dry, your plants can become vulnerable at that point to dryness, but they also can be more vulnerable to the cold. If they're really dry and then it drops quite low into the 20s and such, it would have been very helpful for your planter to have been watered prior to that cold snap. Everything's really dry. They're just much more vulnerable. Water actually works as an insulator to your roots. So it's important in the winter to keep an eye on the watering needs about fertilizing. If you've given your fall plantings a good dose of Oslico, which is a slow release, you've done well for most of the winter. Fertilizer, especially Oslico, really is not going to do anything for you in the winter. But once we have a warm late winter, once we start getting some of those periods, you are going to want to start top dressing with a little bit of some kind of fertilizer to help things flush out after you've given things a bit of a prune back, any kind of dead leaves or things that aren't looking so fresh, you want to just be trimming those as you go, especially coming towards brain. A little bit of maintenance can go a long way with pruning back, a little top dressing, some fertilizer, and making sure that you are keeping things moist enough just to not be too purged. One last thought is based on last winter, we had an awful cold snap and everyone remembers in December, a lot of plants did get killed, um, not only in pots, but in the ground. If you've got some pots that seem like they're particularly vulnerable, it, it would go a long way before, or even in the middle of a really bad cold snap, to move them in closer to that house where they're really well protected. If you've had the precious plants in there and you're really worried about them, 
you could provide temporary cover, just like we do in the spring months when we were planting tender things and we get those cold snaps. Even just a couple nights of a little extra protection can go a long way. Just get creative about that. Going back to my video where we talked about inserts, if we were going to get that same kind of experience where it dropped from the 40s down to zero in such a short period of time, what's convenient about those inserts is that you could pick them up, put them in a garage, for example, for a few nights to protect them from that coldest cold. You certainly don't need to do that all the time. Only during those periods where it's a dramatic experience, it's unusual. That makes sense. If there's any other questions, Allison? Do you name the specific fertilizers? There's a question about that. A lot of potting mixes will have some sort of flow release fertilizers mixed in. We like using Osmocrote, which is a name brand of the little pellets that you can put on. And they're formulated to last four to six months. Just read the label. It works well for most container gardens. A couple of questions, because we have another segment, a video where Laura goes into potting up another plant, which is about 14 minutes. And we understand if you need to get on with your day, we want to thank you for joining us. But if you want to hang out with us, we'd love for you to stay on. Um, Laura, would you leave maybe some pots within a pot and just sink the pot in a planter? Maybe not a perennial, but something else. Have you ever done that? Typically more for a sh very short period for an event or something like that. If you're trying to make an arrangement for a party or something, but typically I don't recommend that. It's just going to really start deteriorating. Certainly in a pinch, you could do that, but I don't recommend it for even a month. They're going to just do much better with the expanded space around the root ball if you can actually plant them. What happens with the long-term planting? How often would you refresh the soil? I get this question a lot. Do I need to fill the whole container with soil for those larger containers? Generally, I like to fill the whole container, uh, especially if I'm using any large perennials, shrubs, grasses, because the roots really go all the way down and they're going to hit whatever substrate you put under there and start to get thirsty. Imagining that I have yeah. filled the whole container with soil, I generally clean out where the existing root ball was. I try to get all that rooty material and I might use that tool that I showed you guys to loosen up the under area of the pot, this existing soil in there. Sometimes I'd find that root ball has gone all the way down and then I am replacing all of that soil. But a lot of times on larger planters, I don't really need to. I just need to take out the root zone, loosen up the existing soil and refresh with fresh soil. So I, I don't generally replace everything. One person asked about disease issues. Do you get into any disease issues? Because the plants are so close together and might be in there for a period of time. Yeah, I, things are pretty full in there. There are certain things that are prone to some fungal issues, but generally I'm keeping an eye on that. If you start seeing some leaf spotting and stuff like we spoke on earlier, cleaning out some of the leaves that are a little bit too tight, generally starting with smaller plants so they have a little bit more space to fill in can help with that and picking out the right plant for the right location, staying on top of the watering and providing as much health, fertilizer and water, you're starting off from the best foot forward in terms of disease. Sometimes you just have to let go of something, decide it's not worth the struggle and replace that one plant if it's fussing at you. Okay. All right. Great. Well, John, let's do our last video and thank you so much. So we are over here at another large container that is ready for renovation for the next season. I will start by saying we did have a really large coleus in here for the summer and probably a couple other blooming annuals. The coleus did start to look a little scraggly and we're just ready for something fresh. This is a type of chemocypris that is definitely overgrown this container, been here a number of years. And we will likely give it through the winter and then plant it out in the garden come next spring. But I think it's going to be fine. This is a very large container. It is filled completely with potting mix. 
And I think it will give us one more winter in this container. The other plants I am going to be mainly leaving. The only other annual is this blooming vinca here. I may or may not decide to keep that still. It's definitely going to be fading and coming up here shortly. And we've got an example of this garden spurge, which I actually don't know which variety this is. It's been here a number of years and you can give you a little bit of a sense of how large it expanded. Now, not all of them do expand this large, but I wanted you to see one of the flower bracts here that actually started creating some foliage at the ends, which is a little unusual, but you can see the remnants of a bloom right here. I don't know if you can, well, you can pick that up. This particular variety is not as contrasting. There are actually even dark purple ones. This one is just a green one. Probably will get a little red tips to it as it gets colder. Here are some spent blooms as well. They are completely browned and those are going to get clipped back completely as well as some more scraggly bits back here. Now I will say I have to remind people that come even earlier in the year after the blooms have started to fade, it would benefit the whole plant to cut that whole flower stalk all the way to the back because you will see new foliage emerge. And this has already done that on this plant. It's already filled in new foliage for the winter and it will, these will be the ones that bloom in the coming year. So printers, we're going to go ahead and just get that clipped up and cleaned up so that we're ready to design the rest of the pot. and. Again, getting back low, if you get one or two scraggly bits with leaves, that's not a problem because it has filled in quite a bit. One little word about euphorbias, they are potentially a skin irritant. So when you are pruning, just be conscious of, and these are dried up and not doing that, but if you cut a fresh stem, it has a milky sap. If it gets on your skin, it may give you a little bit of irritations and some varieties can be quite irritating. So just be cautious of that. All euphorbias generally have that milky sap. Think about your poinsettias. If you ever cut those, you'll notice that. So I'm gonna give this evergreen shrub just a tiny bit of cleanup too, just here at the base where I'm gonna be planting a few things and there's some dead. So this is just a good time just to give it a little cleanup, but not any severe pruning. This plant is really past its peak for shaping and also at this time of the year is not the appropriate time. So we are just going to mainly leave it and see how it fares through the winter. It's really actually looking quite pretty on this side. So this is potentially a pot that I could place anywhere in the garden center. We're going to plant this side up really pretty. A couple other things that are in here. This is black scallop ajuga. It's been implanted for quite a while. It started to spread here. Nice evergreen foliage, shiny and dark, and it's just very, very attractive and does well in containers and mixes well with other plants. This is unusual. We tiled this in this pot last winter. I believe it is a type of cranberry, or we had some huckleberries too that I believe we got from Carolina Native Nursery last fall. And I thought, well, this supposed to be evergreen. Let's give that a try. I like how trailing it is. And it's done very well. It overwintered beautifully and it's not too vigorous. So I'm going to leave that. I might clean it up just slightly here on the ends. Sometimes ends can get, as we're walking by pots and stuff, can get a little bit scraggly. So slight cleanup here and there is all it takes. And then we mentioned this sedum earlier. This is the sedum cebolii. You can see after it's been in this pot for a while, it has really nice trailing stems. And actually these are buds. So it is still gonna bloom here this fall. And it, it's just a gorgeous blue, really pretty texture. A lot of times as I'm picking out plants that trail over the pots, especially, I'm looking for some contrast with the color of the pot. So here we've got this earth, the kind of browns and I'm often thinking about that is there some contrast there or is it all just blending into the pot as we pick out some more plants I'm going to be thinking about that as well one thing to notice is as I'm picking out plants I might decide to remove some of the ajuga or I might decide to reposition it because as you see it has actually filled into the interior of the side of the pot instead of over the side 
So it would be actually beneficial to make some space here. And I'm going to do that using this, this weeder tool that I told you about. Now I'm straight away running into the root ball, this very full shrub. And what's great about this tool here is it's going to let me be pretty targeted. So I'm not going to be doing too much damage and use a little bit of leverage to get in on both sides. And work your way around. You're going to find this a dew that is primarily growing on the top of the pot system, and the root ball of the chemiciparus is a little bit deeper. So I'm able to pry up the yeah, ajuga plant. It would take me a couple minutes here. You see, I'm using the edge of this pot here with this tool for some leverage. And it's really giving me a chance to be able to get the actual root ball instead of just the top part of the plant. So this actually has a little alyssum that was planted in spring that's going to go away. And, you know, at this point you could decide, do you want to use this in this pot or do you want to plant it in your garden? Because you've got a really good root ball system here and great ground cover for your garden. And we've already got some orajuga over here. So we have some options. If I was going to use it in this pot, I would probably reposition it somewhere on along this side because it's already got some trailers here. So you could even open it up some. You don't have to keep it as a central. Let me stand up. You don't have to keep it as a one round shape. You can actually flay it out, if that's a word, or divide it further here. Some is coming apart. And you maybe just want to get, maybe you leave a little bit on this side to complement this. And that way you're creating a little bit more space in your root system zone here for a few more options. So we're going to plant this somewhere else. And we're going to maybe utilize this in here. We'll see. Okay. So that gives you a little foundation of canvas, if you will, to bring in some more seasonal and perennial plantings in this pot. And let's play with it here for a few minutes. Since this tree is so large and the pot is large, I am thinking about proportions here. So if I keep it all really flat and short here, I'm not thinking that's going to be as successful as if I can give some more dimension, this mid filler size. And also we're looking for some color because we've got a lot of green going on. And since this is a sunny location, that's going to allow me to fill in around the edges with some bolder pansies and violas. But for that mid range right now, our options are slightly limited. And the next few weeks, more plants will be coming in some larger Swiss chards and more colorful kales and cabbages. Let's look at this larger ones and get a nice dark fuchsia here. And it is very complimentary, the colors that are here already. This is a compact aster that, again, is going to be a little more seasonal option. So it depends on your goals. Are we wanting to go ahead and get this looking spectacular right now? Are we wanting to wait until there's more options coming in? If I wanted it really prime right now, I probably would just go ahead and put this aster in and know that other things are going to arrive and fill in before long. But this is already going to give me some nice complementary colors here. Then again, we could come in with some color. These are sweet little viola. I think this one's called honeybee. It's really sweet. And again, thinking about color. So when I'm going to be placing this, I'm thinking about one or two cell packs here. I do like cell packs because they allow me to sneak in in small places. I'm going to have to get my tool back out because that, that is tight with the existing plantings. So 
let's pause here and let me get things a little bit positioned and we'll get back in touch. So, like I said, I, this aster here in the middle is kind of a personal choice. Do you really want this to be ready to go for the season or can, are we okay with popping it in and then popping it back out again? Looking around, trying to figure out what option I have for today. It's, it is a good option, but it's not a long-term planting. I'm looking for a little bit of fill right here. And while this is going to get a darker color, it's not going to give you a whole lot more height for the winter. So I keep angling it a little bit more towards the front here and wanting to, that to be a nice focal shape and color here in the front. And then we're looking for something that's going to fill this, if we're not going to use that aster, this right now is not giving me the height, but eventually it's going to give you these longer curly plumes and one thing I like about it is that it's in a small pot and it's going to be able to be easier to get it mixed in with these existing plantings. Another one we could also double up and use this red boar kale because it is going to give you some good height come through winter and I've actually had them over winter and go to flower and their flower stalks are a really creamy pale yellow and they're quite delightful so it actually can be a fun pairing why don't we just go ahead and plan that we're going to use both of those? And I think I'll use the kale, even though it's difficult to tell because we're not actually planting this right now in the interest of time, just designing this. But eventually when it grows, this is going to give you some more height. Both of these are for this middle zone, okay? Some people might even sacrifice this limb here if they really wanted to plant this up. Again, it comes to personal taste and choice. I did want to mention, I haven't mentioned yet any of these herbs and other edibles. We've talked about kale. Swiss chard has beautiful red stems and it can be a nice filler too. Maybe not as winter hardy as the red boar, but still pretty nice. This is a prostrate growing rosemary and it could be, if we had a smaller pot of that, it could be a nice alternative to this plant that we were talking about earlier because it would trail very pretty over it. Some people ask me about the winter hardiness. Prostrate, rosemary, and arp are the two most hardy rosemaries for our zone. And many winters will overwinter even in a pot. It just depends on severity and location. Lettuces, there are some brilliantly red ones. This one's called freckles. We'll get more color um, as it comes in. Sometimes I sneak those in for a little bit of seasonal. Again, maybe not as long lasting, but just trying to give you some options here to fill in and add some more cool season color. So this would be a really pretty pansy or another purple to bounce off these other purples. And then again, don't forget about the little violas. These are a slightly bit leggy. You can trim them back and they will flush out again. We had some heat the last couple of weeks and they're responding to that. But that's all right. Get them planted, get them fertilized, trim them back a little bit, and they will be really pretty over the next couple of months into the cold season and even next spring. I'm going to share with John some photos of some plantings I've done in the past around this time of the year and how they overwintered and looked coming in spring or even in another month or so and give you a feel for how well those really fill in around these perennial plantings. I think. This container is nearly there. It would look really nice again once these start filling in. And you have options. Like we could have put in a more contrasting euphorbia or some four inch mums that we'll be getting in would fit in nicely instead of this aster here. Another option would have been again this angelonia. It would have a nice contrast in color and shape. So really have fun, play with the colors and know that we've given you some examples of perennials that are performing long-term and not just for the winter season. So thanks for watching. Wow, that's just fantastic, Laura. I love being able to see how you've worked that in around a woody plant like that. That's really great. Do you have anything else to say? Any comments or anything? 
just have fun, <laughs> experiment. That's not what it's all about. Think about some of those little tidbits. We think that having containers is a, a very approachable way for a lot of people to still be able to be involved in gardening and have fun with it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura, for your time and your creativity. Really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Okay. Everybody have a great day. See you soon.